Hey guys, how you doing? This is Craig here from Bass Lessons Melbourne and today for my player profile video I'm very honoured to have Mr Francis Rocco Prestia with me. So hey. Thanks for taking the time man, I really appreciate it. Yeah, no problem. Um, so you're here with Tower of Power for the Caloundra Festival. Yes I am. Yeah, how's that been going? Really good, really yeah. nice. The weather's not quite cooperating, but uh, it's pretty nice for the most part. Sure. Yeah. Have you been to Australia a few times? Just once. For this festival? For this festival, yeah. I think it was 2011, I was told. Okay, yeah. So it's been a while. Yeah. Um, maybe we can just start talking about how you got into, how you got into bass. How I got into bass. Why, why the bass? Uh, well, the bass kind of picked me uh, when we started. We used to have a guy come and teach us uh, tunes every week. His name was Terry Saunders in the Bay Area. I was 14, and Emilio was 15. Oh, so you guys knew each other way back then? Yeah, yeah, him and me go back to furthers. Right. Anyway, this guy used to come in and teach us, and he would assess us, you know. <laughs> and when it got to me, uh, I started as a guitar player, right? And I really couldn't play to save my life. So <laughs> um, he got to me and he, he says, "You know, you guys need a bass." <laughs> you know, and in our infinite wisdom, we said, "Well, what's a bass?" <laughs> you know, he said, "Don't worry about it. You need one." So went down to the uh, local music store. Picked up a bass, and that's kind of how it started. Yeah, right. Yeah. Was it a was it a Fender back then, or was it just it, a cheap music store one? I think it was a Fender. Um, I could be mistaken, but I think it was. Sure. So then, did you take lessons in bass at school, or no. just kind of learn mm -hmm. off records? Yeah, pretty much. Just we learned as we went. Okay. <laughs> you know? Yeah. Um, so was that. Did that then become Tower of Power? That band, yes, it did. Um, we, uh, when I joined, it, it was the Extension Five, <laughs> and then we were the Gotham City Crime Fighters. <laughs> and we all dressed up like Batman and Robin, really? and um, then we were the Black Orpheus, and then we were the Motowns, and then Tower of Power. So before all that, was that mainly kind of cover? cover tunes, R&B cover songs, or, or oh, yeah, original yeah, stuff yeah. as well? Well, it, we didn't really get hip to R&B till like, um, I guess probably early 67 or something like that. Okay. Or maybe 66, I don't know. I joined the band in 65, and we were doing stuff by the um, Animals and the Stones and oh, Paul okay. Revere and the Raiders and, you know, some James Brown a little bit and, uh, you know, stuff like that. Yeah. But um, we got hip to soul music and we started adding horns and kind of went from there. Um, we didn't start doing originals until Doc joined the band okay. in 68, which is when we changed the name to Tower of Power as well. And uh, like Mimi and Doc's first tune they wrote together was Still a Young Man, the very first tune. <laughs> Really? Yeah. So, and anyway, that's when we started doing original okay. material. And you guys still play that song yeah. today? Yeah. So we still do. the test of time. Epic. And is that also when your relationship with David Garibaldi started? Dave joined in 1970. 1970, so a few years uh -huh. later. Yeah. yeah. Um, and I speak, having spoken to a few drummers, I know that he um, has been really inspirational to a lot of you know, a, a lot of the drumming community. That's, that's a fact. Yeah. So <laughs> how, what was it like kind of joining forces with him at the start? Was it push-pull or was it, you know, together right it from the beginning? pretty much locked right away. Yeah. Yeah. He was, um, when he joined the band, he had, you know, just this millions of ideas, you know, that he needed to get out. Yeah. <laughs> And you know, and um, 
I came, you know, at that point I was basically from an R&B background. So when you put them together, what came out is pretty much what you hear today. You know, yeah. More refined, obviously, you know, after sure. this many years. But, but uh, yeah, I mean, it, it uh, pretty much clicked right away. Wow. Yeah. How do you find it, you know, when, if you, if you do, how do you find it playing with other drummers having had such a close relationship? You know, rhythmic relationship. I don't really have a problem with drummers. Um, you know, I, I I don't. I mean, I. You know, I mean, unless they're just completely all over the place sure. and have horrible time and all that stuff. But you know, it, for the most part, I've had a pretty good relationship with the drummers that I've played with. Yeah. Um, I think me and Dave have a, a, a definitely a special magic. Sure. That I don't have with anybody else. Yes, but uh, yeah, yeah. And yeah. I was reading a, an interview with you earlier on where you said one of the great things about Tower of Power is that it's it's a it's a band, but you're also strong individual voices as well. Yeah, I I think that's you know obviously due to just who we are, but also due to the fact that the way the band is structured especially in the rhythm section, we're pretty much free to go where we're, we want to go. Mm. Uh, we're, you know, I mean, there, there's obviously cases where, you know, the writer might, whoever wrote the tune might want a specific thing here or there. But for the most part, for the most part, it's just, you know, in this ballpark, go for it. Yeah, cool. Because <laughs> yeah. I've seen you play a couple of times and you never really seem to play it the same way, twice. I don't know. I'm pretty boring to myself, so. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But it's I guess that, you know that it would be probably harder to be involved in in a band for that long if you didn't have some kind of musical leeway. To I'm sorry. It would be difficult to be involved if you didn't have some freedom within the yeah. The material. Well, I mean the tunes, even the old tunes that we do, like what is hip and all that stuff. I mean, they keep, they continue to evolve. Yeah, I mean, that's they cool. continue to grow. So, uh, and I think that's what keeps it fresh for us yeah. as individuals is to not be afraid to, you know, d just get off the script sometimes and, you know, go other places. Sure, yeah. So that, that definitely helps. <laughs> yeah. And is there maybe some, some bass players who you could maybe cite as being influential or? Yeah, sure. I mean, I, I came up during, you know, in the States, it was about sounds. You had, uh, you know, the Memphis sound, you had the Motown sound, right. the Philly sound, James Brown, um, there was Sly Stone, mm. but it was about sounds. So I didn't really know who the players were till later, but it's people like James Jamerson, Duck Dunn. Yeah. You know, Willie Weeks, Chuck Rainey, Gerald Jamont, you know, those kind of guys. So yeah. those are the guys I came up with. Yeah, and having attempted to learn a few of your bass lines myself, it seems like there's a certain element of, of, uh, of jazz influence in there, would that be right? In the way that you connect I the suppose, chords? I mean, it, I certainly am not a jazz guy, <laughs> yeah. you know. But um, when we, uh, when we, had Chester Thompson in the band, you know, he is a definite jazz guy. Yeah. And so he influenced a lot of things of okay. that nature that they'd have that flavor to it, so. Yeah. But you, you don't play upright, you don't no, do standards no, gigs. No, 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 no. Do you play any other instruments? Apart uh -huh. from guitar? <laughs> <coughs> no. No? No. Fair enough. Um, what else? Do you still have any kind of practice schedule or regime, or is it just warming up? No, and I've never. <laughs> never? <laughs> no, I've never been one to practice. Uh, you know, I, I, I get criticized for that quite a bit, but uh, <laughs> it's just my nature. It's very boring to me. I, right. I, it's not fun to me. Sure. Um, I mean, there are other guys in the band, I mean, they practice like crazy, that they have a routine and stuff. Yeah. For me, it just never has worked, which is not 
to say that that's what you should do or try to try to go for because when we have a lot of off time, <clears throat> you know, if we have some space in between gigs and stuff, that can be a little rough. <laughs> yeah. No. yeah. So um, I, I'm actually getting to a place where I don't practice, but I I, I will get up and just pick the bass up just to you know. Yep. I guess keep lubricated, as it were. Sure. <laughs> <laughs> you know, try to keep the chops up so you know you don't go through that whole cycle of blistering and all yeah, that yeah. stuff. So. And what what about life off the road? What about it? Things. What what do you do when you're not playing? Do you have any passions? Uh, when I'm home, you know, music is over there. Yeah. You know, uh, I don't really bother with it that much. I mean, I live in a musical town. I live in Las Vegas, but I don't, I'm not interested in really getting out and, and doing that whole thing. I did a couple things recently, uh, a little bit out of my comfort zone. And I gotta tell you, if, you know, if I was to do it, if I had to do what I see a lot of players do, which is learn millions of tunes, yeah. Uh, all these different genres and blah blah blah. Uh, to me, that's not fun. Sure. <laughs> you know, it's it's more nerve wracking than than anything, and you don't really get a chance to really, you know, sink your teeth into really anything. Yeah. Because you're just kind of all over the place. Yeah. Um, you know, being with one group for so long, I think is, you know, what, you know you know, was instrumental in, you know, helping everybody develop themselves as individuals, so. Yeah. Yeah. So anyway, I think a lot of players, because the industry is a, 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 a lot different now than it, than it used to be, so I think it is, it is a lot different. of players just to, just to keep working. Well, there's not as many, you know, club days. I was just having this conversation, you know, yeah. and it's funny because, <laughs> You know, when disco came to America, you know, which pretty much was started by, what, the Bee Gees, right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, to me, that ruined the whole music industry, really, <laughs> you yeah. know, personally. Yeah, because it put a lot of people out of work, right. you know. Um, and so the struggle, you know, for guys that are freelance became even that much harder, mm. you know. I mean, you know, you have club owners that used to hire bands, you know, four to five days a week, and you had a rotation you could and do. big, big bands and as well. And when disco came in, they figured out, gee, it's a lot cheaper to spin a record than, uh, than to hire all these guys. So, you know, but it's the nature of the business. It evolves, it changes. You know? mm. So, I mean, how would that reflect in the, the Tower of Power? Touring schedule? Are you di are you guys doing more festival circuit now than than club dates or uh, depends no, not where you are? Necessarily, um, we are going to do a f quite a few festivals next year in Europe. But um, you know, it fluctuates. You know, it's, sometimes it's like this, sometimes you know, it's yeah. like that. We hope to have a, a new record out next year, so hopefully that will. Uh, make the quality of gigs um, be a little bit more consistent exactly. on a different level. So you level. St still to go into the studio and record that? Say it again? You've still to record that album? I've already done my part. You've done your part? They're fixing everything else now. <laughs> <laughs> so do, uh, maybe asking about the recording process, is it together or is it overdubbed? I mean, how has that changed for you guys? Yeah, over they the layer years? it. You know, you it. get the rhythm section, and then everything else is layered on top. Okay, is that generally how it's how it's played out over the years? You guys? Yeah, pretty much. I mean, we've done a few, a couple of um, live recording in the studio, mm. as well as a live album. But uh, yeah, for the most part, it's layered like that. Okay. Yeah. Um, would you have any? advice for a young Rocco, <laughs> if you could go back and give yourself some, <coughs> some words of advice or... Advice? Yeah. <laughs> well, uh, the, the rule of thumb is, you know, keep your nose clean, uh, stay out of trouble and, uh, yeah. and do as little amount of drugs as possible and don't drink too much. <laughs> 
and be focused, you know, be focused. And a big thing is um, learning how to treat your fellow musician. Mm. I, I, I seem to run into a lot of guys that, um, you know, they say, oh man, I'm having problems with the bass player, I'm having problems with the guitar player, this and that. And I asked them, the first thing I asked them was, how do you talk to them? You know, and then they tell me, and it's like, well, you, you know, you can't expect good results if you are attacking somebody and, you know, or, or talking down to them or anything like that. So the way you talk to each other is really, really important. Yeah. And um, I think that's, uh, you don't necessarily learn that right away, especially when you're younger. Sure. You know, but that to me is a big one. Yeah. You know. Um. And have you, do you write? Have you written a lot of the material or co-wrote? Yeah, uh, I'm more of a co kind of guy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, um, but yeah, I, I did a solo album yeah. back in 98. Yeah. And I was involved with all of that. How long did that take you to? I'm sorry? How long did that take you to, to put together? Was that a collection of 10 years worth of no, ideas no, and stuff? Or was no, it just? No, no, a couple of years. Put maybe. it together? It, it the most. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Getting the deal was the hardest part. Really? You know, actually the writing at that time because of the people I was associated with, that was pretty, uh, it flowed pretty pretty easily. Yeah. I got pretty close to enough for another album, but again, the financing comes into play. Sure. And um, there's a couple things on the new Tower record that I was involved with. Or, I don't know, a few things, I guess. So, cool. yeah, a little bit here and there. Yeah. Is it, in, in the Tower of Power situation, is it more of um, an arranging orchestration feel thing or har harmonic, melodic things, just bass line stuff? Um, well, I mean, it pretty much is what it is. I mean, sure. you know, the tune kind of takes on its own life after, you know, Once you the get the basics it, yeah. of it down, you know. I mean, it's like, you know, I, if it was, a, you know, like a ballad lends itself more to a big orchestration than, you know, just a regular funk tune or something. Yeah. But, um, yeah, I mean, you know, I think every tune has its own, yeah. you know, own life. So, you know, and it evolves and yeah. goes where it goes. It goes where it goes, sure. Um, Looking back over an enviable career, is there maybe some certain albums or eras that stick out as being highlights, or you just take it all as one awesome journey? Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, Must be difficult. You to know, it's it, it, when you when you talk about your personal life and how it intertwines with your professional life, I mean, there are certainly things that uh, I wish I wouldn't have done uh, that would have probably made my life a lot easier. Um, you know, then it, there's that other side of it. It's like, well, if I didn't go through all that, then I wouldn't be who I am today. So, sure. you know, it's kind of a toss up. But, you know, um, you know, I think personally, the late '60s and, and the '70s was the best time yeah. for music, period. You know, across the board. You know. Yeah, there was definitely a lot of creativity and and. Yeah, I mean, if you listen to commercials and movies and this and that, I mean, what do you hear? You hear a lot of stuff from the '70s. I mean, yeah, you know, yeah. Maybe we could talk a little bit about the the gear that you're using. The who? The instruments, the gear. Uh -huh. um, you're with ESP now, is that right? ESP, uh, LTD. the model I play is an LTD, yeah. Yeah. Is that a signature model? Is that a signature model? Uh, yeah, for the most part. <laughs> <laughs> what, what, what prompted the, the switch from the precision? <coughs> I didn't switch from the precision. I haven't played Fender in years. Oh, okay. Yeah, I was playing Conklin. That's right. You yeah. know, and before that I was playing Fernandez. 
Yeah, so actually, um, I had a friend uh, named Pancho Tomaselli. He used to play with War, bass player. Really nice guy. Crazy, but nice. <laughs> um, anyway, he said, you know, this, uh, you know, he had just signed with them, and he said, man, you need to check out this company, man, ESP, man. They really would be interested in you. And I said, yeah, yeah, yeah. And at that time, I was working on a deal uh, uh, in Germany. So ultimately, what happened was the German thing fell through, and I talked to my manager about it. And he said, yeah, well, let's check them out. So I checked them out, and it was just, um, I mean, it was just a wonderful um, connection right from the start. And they have been nothing but great to me, and they're a great company. Yeah, so. cool. Nice one. Um, I covered a lot of ground. <laughs> I guess. Yeah. <laughs> I'm trying to think of any also, burning I just, questions. I just signed a deal with Eden, so I'll be switching oh. over to Eden cool. soon. Yep. Yeah. Nice. There's well, still, it's all in development still, so. Yeah. I'm sure it will sound great no matter what you play. <laughs> oh, well, thank you. <laughs> yeah. Um, well, cause thanks very much for your time. It's We're been done? great. Yeah, we're done. Yeah. Appreciate it, man. All right. Guys, thanks for watching. We'll see you next time. <laughs>